Here, you can exercise your rights to freedom every day without leaving your home. We don't just say, we do. It's the Stay in City way. Welcome to another interesting episode of Real Talk with Anele. For centuries, humans have willfully modified their bodies as symbolism embedded in culture, tradition, race, and even fashion sense. Look up the modern day definition of the word aesthetic, and you will see that almost all of us change our appearance in some way or another. My first guest, Conrad Feldman, is a professional body modification artist who wants to take the body modification industry to the next level. He'd like to educate and dispel negative stereotypes commonly associated with expressing oneself through body art. We welcome Conrad to Real Talk. Do you know what I love about this? Is the fact that I get to ask you these questions that I wanted to ask people like, like at the post office or at the park or like at the shopping center. First one, the ears, eh? is that the commonly asked, commonly asked question? How, like, how do you get that big in, yeah. in your ear? Well, first is, is it sore? <laughs> okay, then let's run through that. Is it sore? My shoe just fell off. Well, anything in life that you do, a bit of pain involved. Um, but uh, it pretty much starts off as a normal ear piercing and you just stretch it slowly over time, usually about one millimeter a month uh -huh. until you reach your goal size and there you stick until you're unhappy and want to go bigger or let it shrink down. Okay, so if you had to take that out, your ear would close? It, at, my, at my size, it would shrink not too much, uh -huh. but um, anywhere from six millimeters to eight millimeters, if you stretch um, well over time mm. and you took it out, it will shrink down quite small again. Do you take those out when you sleep? No. So that stays? I've, I've, uh, the reason I'm at this size is because this is where my comfort level kind of went to. Okay. Any bigger, it starts becoming uncomfortable with, for me to sleep with the, the piercings in. And, um, you know, I, would, I, I never do anything to my body that I'm not comfortable with yeah. that will, will allow me to function normally in life. Uh -huh. And do you have then other sizes of and other designs of earrings that you just like take out and swap in with another one? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so also the colors different is your expression vibe. Yeah. I mean, you can you can accessorize it the way you want with what you're wearing. Okay. So body modification. Yes. If you had to give it a definition, uh, under what you do with your body, what is it? Communication. There we go. What are you communicating to me? It is the first form of communication that we all use. Uh -huh. um, I mean, if you, if you give a child a, a felt tip pen, yeah. first thing it's going to do is draw on itself. True. Right? True. It's, it's exercising its freedom. Mm. You know, um, we, we, we communicate a lot of things, like my ears, for instance. You know, culturally, in, in a lot of cultures, it's used as a way to show patience because if you rush it, you're gonna have problems. You're gonna tear your ear. So it shows it shows a lot of things. I think it's the Zulus who actually, um, I asked um, one of the guys one day, he was a petrol attendant, yeah. and I asked him why he does it. And he said to me very interestingly that um, it's to open up his ears to the ancestors, which I found very Which is quite cool. interesting. Yeah. So I, you know, I always read the statement, you know, be it in fashion magazines or hear it in these like fashion shows, um, and they say dress the way you want to be addressed. So this is why when you say communication, I'm like, I hear what you're saying. So how do you want to be then addressed? Like, what are you communicating? What are you saying about yourself when you, when you like if you modify your body? Well, firstly, I'm 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 making it very well known that I'm an individual, that I'm not trying to look like. Everybody else. Kim Kardashian or, <laughs> you know, whoever. Yeah. Type of a thing. You know, um, every, every part of my body that I've chosen to modify is communicating a little bit of something about me. And, you know, it's, it's, it's up to that person. Like you say, you've always wanted to ask people. Yes. You know, but do you ever do it? I don't, because you know what, like, now <coughs> we're in the mall and none of your business, lady, 
Do you know what I'm saying? I just never know like how far. Uh, believe, but it, also believe it or not, a lot of us who do modify ourselves would rather you ask than just stare. Uh. You know, a lot of us who, who, who go into the more extreme stuff and everything would, would just rather you ask and, and, and actually stand there and listen to uh. our story. Uh. You know, because a lot of us who, who go through this journey of modifying our bodies, we've, we've gone through that whole thing of being stigmatized and everything. Mm -hmm. And we actually all realize that, you know, teaching people is the only way mm -hmm. to, to destroy these stigmas of everything. Is, is, is there too far, like something you wouldn't do to your body? Yes, I'm, I mean, the, the modification is such a wide, a wide spectrum of, of, of intensity. Um, I mean, we, th there are people who, who border on body dysmorphia disorder who will want to remove limbs and stuff like that. You oh, know, like Marilyn they, Manson. Because they don't feel like it belongs there, uh. you know, type of a thing. Whereas ethically, as a practitioner, I will never do anything to a person that, that will, will stop the normal functioning of their body. So this is what you do for a living then? Yes. So you, you body morph other people? I'm, I'm mostly a businessman at the moment, but <laughs> okay. I, do, I do still practice, yeah. This is where I want to go with this, because yeah. there's like this stereotype that a businessman is in a suit with a shirt and a tie and a briefcase you, and you, hair that's <laughs> like military razor cut vibe, you know. Yeah. Has your look ever hindered you from getting any business? It did in the beginning when I was not confident. When I first started my businesses, I was pretty much turned away from every financial institution for loans that, yeah. that, that you can imagine. Um, and it broke me down a lot. It broke my confidence in, in what I knew I could do uh. well. But it also helped me because I, I figured out ways. I was driven to find ways that, that didn't start with debt. And so, and so when I started my business, even though it was slow, mm. um, it, it, it ran at a profit from the word go. Because, because you I didn't, didn't owe nobody I didn't, money. I didn't own any, uh, yeah. any money to anyone. So, you know, in a way, that's, that's how you have to look at life. You know, it's, it, it, you may not get what you want straight away, but maybe you're getting something that's a little bit better yeah. for you in the future. You, know, you just have to change your perspective of it all. Yeah, sticking to who you are yeah. is, is kind of a better path to where you want to be than just, you know... Yeah. And the more the little successes grew, the more confident I became, uh, the more I walked and wore my body art better, uh, which made people take notice and wonder, hell, this guy is confident. Uh, you know, that's the type of guy I want to do business with. So are you heading to a place where everything is going to be tattooed? Because, I mean, I'm looking at the body art here and I'm like, okay, you know, I've seen people tattoo their faces. Are we headed there? Well, yeah, I mean, it's always been there. Um, but personally, myself, I, because I deal with such a great range of people, yeah. you know, business-wise and everything, you can't push the so society too quickly. I like that you said that. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it, it, you, you, you cannot um, be naive to the world we live in, mm. but we can slowly break down barriers as mm. we go. Um, we... I mean, my organization, you know, is, is very well respected for, for, for the fact that we create this environment of comfort mm. where we don't discriminate against anybody. Mm. You know, it's, with us, it's cold, hard fact. You come to us with an idea for your procedure, we give you the facts on whether or not it's a good idea to do it, and we take it from there. Ethics. Yeah. Ethics. You know, I used to have a lip ring and a tongue ring, and then I had to take it out because I couldn't speak properly on radio because I'd play with it like, <laughs> It's still open, by the way. Sorry? It's still open, It is still open. So <laughs> makeup does a lot of tricks. Conrad, thank you so much for your time and your insight. And from now on, if I see you or anyone you know in, in, at the shopping center, I'm going to right up ask. Yes. If I get slapped, I'm coming back to you. <laughs> uh, that was Conrad Feltman. If you're curious to learn more, stay exactly where you are, because after the break, we'll talk about tattoos and scarification. Don't go anywhere. Quickly, did you hear Conrad say businesses, not business?
And welcome back to Real Talk with Mianele on SABC3, where the stage is yours. The practice of tattooing is believed to have originated over 10,000 years ago. The mechanics, ink and pigments, of course, have improved, but the basic reasons behind the choice to get inked has not changed much. In addition to body ink, there is another unique way of decorating your skin. Scarring or branding might be a less popular form of body modification, but there is beauty in it. Bramley Lutech has always been drawn to the visual world and sees tattoo as the ultimate art form. Joining him on the couch is Mushe Aramakuba, and he's also into another form of body modification, which is scarring. Welcome, guys. Sure, thank Just you. a quick, like, I noticed something. Your, your tattoos on your hand, it says rock and roll, right? Yes. So when you're beating someone up, you're like, <laughs> come, put this me rock and roll. <laughs> no, no, it's got nothing to do with well, that. It's more because it's... It's, it's just the type of music I've always been drawn to. Is it? Yeah, so that's okay, what it's so for. are you in a band? And no, no, no. You see, you've got the look. Now, this is the <laughs> stereotype that comes with, like, being tattooed, you know? People look at you like, oh, he probably plays in those heavy metal, chop suey, system of a down bands. Yeah, yeah, well, they think I'm a biker. Oh, which you are not. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> but, but, but out of that, out of that stereotype, uh, type of one. So, your first tattoo, wh what did you get? Um, my very first one, my mom actually took me for it. Uh -huh. I was at the age of 16. Uh -huh. And I actually went and I got it done and it was just a band around my arm. And then from there, every year, it's just been getting more and more. Uh -huh. And then obviously, from traveling around the world, every country I visited, I've actually gotten a tattoo from that style within that country. So a stamp is not enough in your passport. No, You're just like, no. I'm going to stamp my body. Well, you know what? <laughs> you, uh, your passport, you can lose. Yeah. Your tattoo will stay with you forever. And that memory of what you went through and where you've been will always be there with you. OK, we're going to come back to you. Um, Musha, you yeah. are into something, you know, like tattooing, but it's mm -hmm. scarring. So mm -hmm. you literally, what, you are cutting into your body? What's the, what's the scientific method there? <laughs> Um, so with scarring, basically what you're doing is that you're creating a scar from, from your own body. So you're using keloid to keloid. create, yes, keloiding to create that scar. What's, what's that? So keloiding is basically the scar tissue that grows in between your skin layers. So it's basically a blowout of scar tissue. So yes. how, how do you make sure that, because I mean, I've had a few scars in my life, you know, mm -hmm. you know, danger with me. <laughs> but how do you prevent your scar from healing? Because I see your arm, mm -hmm. you've got like the art on there. Mm -hmm. But surely, I, I mean, I've had scars on, but now they're gone, so they mm -hmm. healed. So how in your process do you make sure that your scar doesn't heal? How I do that is by irritating. So as opposed to, you know, using methods that heal, I use methods that prolong the healing process in order to have the keloiding and have that raised sort of texture on my arm. So like you would yeah. go to like color in or re-ink re your tattoo, for mm -hmm. you as soon as it looks like it's about to heal, then you go in and you, you re-scar it? Uh, no, I don't re-scar it. I just use methods like um, washing with saline solutions or using like salt rubs and things like that in order to create that irritation which prolong the healing process. Do you yeah. ever get to a point where it's now permanent, there's no more irritation needed? Yeah. I are do. you there now? Yeah, I'm there now. Are, what, are you addicted to the feeling of the scarring? Which, which process <laughs> do you like? Do you like the way it looks? Or are you addicted to, like, to when they like scarring you? Um, everything. I love everything about it. Mm. Yeah. And you, I mean, many people who've got tattoos, in fact, Everyone has got a tattoo. We said they love the feeling of the, the is of it the a ne needle? The needle, yes. you know, inking your body. Uh, well, in essence, a lot of people can see it as their own form of therapy. Y yes. You know, so they'll go through. Th so depending, depending on what they're going through in their life, they're going through a hard time. They'll come and they'll get tattooed, and it'll be like almost like a release for them. Yeah. And then sometimes if it's a good thing, they'll come through to celebrate something like that you know, to celebrate oh. that moment in time for them. So it's like a, it's like adding like a, a chapter to their journal of life. So they keep building up onto it. So the sensation and the pain is either heightened or decreased by what you are currently going yes. through at the moment. Yes. And a lot of things affected. If you don't have a good night's sleep can affect the way you handle the pain. If you didn't have a good breakfast or you you know, you, if you're just not in that right mindset, uh, it can affect the way that the, the tattoo actually feels on your body. Uh, have you ever had a bad experience getting a tattoo? 
No, I've, I've gone through a fair, good fair share of pain. Mm. Having been tattooed, I've been held down to be tattooed because if you move around too much, mm. and I've just wanted to get it done, and I'm just like, okay, let's just get it done. But otherwise, never had a bad experience, anything like that, and we obviously don't want to give anyone a bad experience yeah. at the same time. Yeah. You know, because the whole thing with the tattooing is not just the actual tattoo. Yeah. It's the experience you're also giving someone, yeah. you know, because you're in very close proximity with someone, you're hurting them, so you, they, in essence, they open up. Yeah. yeah. They will easily... And it's a very personal thing. This yes. Is, this mm. is something that's going to be with them forever. Yes. Right? So you kind of have to build that rapport with them as well. Yes, and you, you in essence, you build up their trust. Yeah. You know, you give them a good time, you joke with them, you know, they, they'll tell you a whole bunch of stories, what the tattoo means, what they're going through. A lot of times, sometimes you can relate as well. Mm. And so you create that familiar bond. At the I same hear what time. you're saying about the therapy session. So do you have one that you are, you know, like more like tied to than the other ones? Or is it like your kids? You're not allowed to say which one's your favorite. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those you can't, you can't really say which one is your favorite. There are a few that over time you actually, you go, okay, that's the part that I don't want anymore. And you go and you want to get it covered up or get it blacked out. And oh, then, yeah. okay. So as you grow, things, things stay and things go. Yes, it all depends on the person. You know, you know, some people decide now with the tattoos they want to have do a full blackout on their arm yeah. and then redo the designs, but now using white ink or your grayscale inks. Yeah. So it all varies from person to person. Could you um, backtrack and not have scarring again? Um, no. So no, it's, it's basically like a permanent thing. It's something so that it's you the have the for the rest thing. of your life. Yeah. And I see the one on your one arm. Do you have anything on the other arm? Not yet. Do you do it on yourself or does somebody else do it to you? Um, there is somebody who does it to me, yeah. So there's a, there's a shop where you can go and say, hi, I'm here for scarring. Yep. But what about the, um, the stigma attached to the fact that people who cut themselves are depressed? That is one of the things that I had to deal with in the beginning while doing this. I mean, a lot of people when they saw me, that's what they thought. They thought that something was wrong. They didn't see the beauty behind it. You yeah. know, I always had to sort of explain to them that no, it's not that. It's this, it's not that, it's this. But lately, nowadays, people are sort of getting used to it. You know, okay, they, so yeah. run me through it. It's not that, it's this. Yeah. Because now you're paraphrasing and we went there. So <laughs> please, like, let's behave like I'm a fly where you have to explain yourself. It's not that, okay. what is that, and then what is this? Okay, it's not that meaning that it's not self-harm. It's not somebody wanting to commit suicide. Yeah. It's somebody who wants to make their body look good through scarring. It's yeah. someone who loves the artwork behind scarification and mm -hmm. someone who wants to get it done and someone who sees great meaning in it. Yeah. Who would you not recommend get scarring? Hmm. Anyone can get it. Anyone can get Anyone it. Can so there isn't like a specific skin type where it looks, it looks better or on all, on all of that? Well, it does look slightly better on darker skinned people. But That's anybody can going. get it, yeah. Because I don't think, look, no offense, buddy, <laughs> but, you know, sorry, Bram. <laughs> no, I no, think no. tattoos are great on you, but scarring, no. like, we, okay, fine. So let's, we, we're here, we're friends. Mm -hmm. when, when a white person scars, don't they go like red or pink? Yeah, they do. Which then, is, is, do. is it as beautiful? Is it as, as, as aesthetically nice? Have you done it? I have or? seen quite a few people, and it is. Oh. It is just as beautiful, yeah. Oh, next it time is. you come, please bring a white friend. Because <laughs> now we don't have any like, <laughs> images that go with it. Guys, thank it you so much for joining us. You have thank a you. tattoo parlor. Yes, yes. Uh, oh. Yes, uh, I'm, I run the tattoos. Um, I'm the manager side of the tattoo studio. Okay. Along with uh, one of the senior artists. Okay. Yes. Because right. you have to be an artist, otherwise you're going to mess my picture up. Yes, we have to be an artist. <laughs> oh. You have okay. to be an artist. Interesting. <laughs> As you can see, I'm blown away. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, to Mushe and Bramley. After the break, I have a guest who's done a 360, like a total one change to her body. You want to see the stay tuned. And welcome back. So today we're talking about body modification and altering your appearance. Nicole Lowe is South Africa's first transgender alternative model and a photographer. Not only has her appearance and life changed completely by going through the process of transitioning into a female, but her body also got inked and pierced over time. We welcome Nicole, who was kind enough to match her hair to my dress. Well, you know, I try. 
<laughs> you know, you are the perfect guest. Thank Nicole, you, you yeah. were inked before uh, you transitioned. What was the significance behind inking your body? Um, every tattoo that I've gotten has a story to it. My, mm. my tattoos are a diary of my life. Okay. So the, I had far less tattoos when I started my transition, but even subconsciously, they told the story that I was going to go through. Okay, so, so each phase of your transition, you'd add a tattoo. Exactly. So it was kind of like a, exactly. like a parallel or, or, road. Or as something happened that had any sort of significance to me. So I, had, I got two angels on my back, and one's a boy and one's a girl, uh -huh. and the boy is sad and lonely, and the girl is embraceful and enlightened, but I got this before I'd even realized or come to accept the fact that I was transgender. It just subconsciously spoke to me. So, and the butterfly in your chest? Um, the butterfly symbolizes, um, there's, there's, there's a couple of meanings, but it's half biomechanical and half animal. So it symbolizes that we are all inherently animal, mm -hmm. but we are shaped by society to believe certain things and certain aspects. But it, then obviously a butterfly also represents re growth and yeah, rebirth. Like a, is, what is it, a silkworm? It's, it's a, it, yeah, I think it's a silkworm. It's a caterpillar. Cater that's it. Yes. In a cocoon and then, and then you reborn. And then you reborn and this is you being reborn. Exactly. As so I've got that over and over. It's the same with the phoenix on my arm. Phoenix um, rising from, rising the, from ashes. the ashes. So it's a reoccurring theme on me. Okay, so how long, obviously it, it gets in, in, it's in your mind and you think about it and you dream about it. You're like, okay, I'm going to put that on my body. How long from the thought to ha actually having it on your body? Um, it used to be a lot longer. Now if I see something, I'll get it then and there. Really? I am, yeah. You said you're addicted to it. I am. I am. And I, you know, like I said, and people always ask me, do I have the meaning before I get the tattoo? And I used to. Uh. But now I'll get the tattoo because I'm drawn to it and I'll find meaning in it. You know, so there's not necessarily always a meaning or thought behind it. I'm recklessly impulsive. Do you ever worry that you'll run out of space, like, like run of billboard? Um... <laughs> Well, you know, like, like um, was discussed earlier, I, um, I can just tattoo over it if I need oh. to. If something changes or something happens in my life where I feel the need to not have that anymore, mm. then I can just tattoo over it. The one on your neck the, yes. that meets at your piercing on, on your chest. Yes. That's actually quite cool. Because it means you don't have to wear a necklace. You exactly. Like you're wearing a necklace. Permanent or was that the plan, that you don't want to wear a necklace? Well, I'm not an accessory person. I don't like jewelry and stuff like that. So uh -huh. I'd rather wear it in my skin. Than and uh, did you always have dimples? I want dimples. <laughs> I really so then, want... you, then you just need to get these. Okay, so is that why you got them? I am. Um, when I was a lot smaller, there was a girl that I knew who had them, and I was always, always drawn to it. Not like sex. I think I was like twelve. Yeah. And I was always drawn to it. It was the cutest thing ever. And um, and I got my eyebrow pierced and my lip pierced and my tongue pierced and everything. And then eventually I plucked up the guts to get these. So I took everything else out. Okay. So do you do research? Um, with people who do piercings to be like, okay, can I pierce dimples in? Did you try to get surgery to get dimples? I, um, I, knew, I knew they were piercings. Oh. So, you know, and I, I make sure I surround myself with the best in the business when it comes to piercings, tattoos, oh. and stuff like that because I don't want to regret it at a later stage. Um, okay, now totally off the top of yes. just for me. Can one get surgery for dimples? Because I really want dimples. Just get, a, just get the piercings. If I take these out, those dimples will stay there. Really? Yeah. So how long must I get the piercing? Like a day or a month? Yeah, you'd have to wait for it to heal. I assume a year or so. I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll, I think it would look cute on you. Dude, I know I'd look amazing Oh, with there dimples. we go. Like, so the, like, the end of me, discussion. I, be, I, be, be impulsive. I've done this, okay? I've done <laughs> the research and I've totally like put my face like in a little modifier on an iPad. I would look amazing with dimples. Well, there you go. Were those sore to pierce? They were the least painful of all my piercings. My lips were a lot worse. Uh, on a scale of one to biting yourself on your inner cheek? If, if biting yourself on the inner cheek, it's the same pain. You don't really feel the needle go in, you feel it coming out on the inside. The how, what's, what's the most painful thing you've ever gone through? Give birth. It's a one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a one. Next to that, it's not even a one, it's a point one. Okay, so where are you in your life right now and what tattoo is going to be next to symbolize where you are? I am, um, so obviously I'm still currently undergoing my transition. That's something that's going to happen for the rest of my life, you know. Really? Yeah, I mean, it's um, my hormones and stuff. I don't want to go too deep into it, but obviously I don't produce my own estrogen and yes. stuff like that. So it's so something, something that you consistently so have to it's do. it's a constant growth. So it's a constant, and I have to learn things that most girls learn when they're young, you know. Uh -huh. So it's a constant thing. I'm only four years in now. Uh -huh. um, but the next tattoo I'll get is I'm blacking out my entire arm. Mm. Um, 
to symbolize that there is always darkness around us, but it's not, it, you don't have to be scared of that. Uh. You don't have to be scared of the dark. Uh. Um, and then after that, I'm going to scarify into that to show the beauty in the darkness. Is the darkness referring to your transitioning phase and the people around you and the support you got and the support you didn't get? Um, you know, pre-transition life was, during that first year of transition, I suppose, was really tough. I lost a lot of people, I lost a lot of friends, a lot of family and stuff mm. like that. But I've learned that through all those ne negative situations, mm. there's a lot of beauty that comes out of it. Through it, I found my, tr my fiance and I found new friends who are extremely supportive. And you know, when you feel you're gonna be really alone, it's not really the case. There's always someone there. You lost a lot of friends and family and people around you. Have any of them come back? Because sometimes we make these impulse decisions where we want to impose our beliefs on other people. Yes. And when you realize that it's working out for you and look how amazing you are yeah. and you're happy and you've got great skin and you're glowing and you're <laughs> great and you're like, you know what, you know, let me go back there. It's, um, you know, a lot of the friends, not. You know, but I also, I chose to distance myself from them. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a different person than I was back then. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a few friends who have stuck by me, mm -hmm. but most, majority of them, not so much. Um, family, they came back, okay. you know. They, um, I think it was an, an initial shock. I'm completely different. I was like a cage fighter and mm -hmm. a bouncer, and I was like, it was completely not me. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I think they just needed a break to come to terms. It's something I've known my whole life. Mm -hmm. They only had just found out. So they needed that time to adjust as well. It's not all about me, unfortunately. Oh, damn. I wish you know. And your modeling, how did you get into that? Um, From cage fighting to being a bouncer to being someone who needs a bouncer? Well, uh, well I wish. I wish. <laughs> um, you know what? I, uh, I did it for self-confidence, if nothing else. I, um, I really disliked the way I looked and stuff like that, and I felt I needed to do something that would help me with that. So there was no grand ambition. There was no... Mm -hmm. There was no goal in mind other than to be in front of a camera and try to make myself feel slightly sexier. Mm. And it just kind of carried on from there, you know. But I mean, you know, are there, are there jobs out there? Um, Do you have to struggle for them? Are you... Because, I, I mean, now you've just come from being ostracized by family and friends and working through that, and then you do, like, the, the job in the world that comes with the biggest ostracizing. And it was a learning curve, trust me. And you, yeah. the, you am, I, am I correct in saying you're the first transgender model I, in South Africa? I was, I was. A first transgender alternative model. Alternative so, the, so there model. have been mainstream model, okay. transgender models, but alternative, yeah. What does alternative mean? I live an alternative lifestyle, tattooed, piercings, oh, coloured hair. I'm not, okay. I don't fit into it. I'm not, I'm not Na Naomi Campbell. You know? So you're I'm making not... your life even more difficult. Exactly. You know? just <laughs> so that's so what I you're like saying a challenge. to me. I like a challenge. But, um, so, yeah, it was just, I, I never had any ambitions to earn money from it or mm. get jobs. It was purely a fun thing. It was for my self-confidence more than anything else. So, you and know, now your self-confidence is there and you make money. I try, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a good life. Um, it all comes with its challenges, but, you know, nothing easy ever came... Nothing worthwhile ever came easy. Yeah. So, yeah. I, you've got such a good spirit. I really, like, I believe into you. Does well, that make sense? I hope so. I like, hope so. You, you just, you're very easy. And this tells me that this is you. You are happy. I, I've, I've never been happier. You know, the, fun, the funniest thing was, um, and someone brought it up with me a while ago, um, when I was living my old life, yeah. I was constantly sick. I was constantly drinking. I was constantly um, had issues. And the moment I realized who I was and started my transition, I haven't been sick since. So in four years, I haven't had a cold. I haven't had, and it just shows that once your body aligns with your soul, you know, everything just kind of works out. Nicole Lowe, thank you for your time. Thank you. It was great. Thank you to Nicole for sharing her story. What a transformation, right? After this quick break, we'll meet a man who has also drastically changed his appearance, but without going under the knife, getting inked or pierced. This is Real Talk. Welcome back to Real Talk. So one of the most involved, long-term and committed types of methods to modify one's body must be through bodybuilding. You have to work incredibly hard and be dedicated to gym, exercise, diet. My next guest started training because he thought he had a future in rugby as a springbok, but he soon decided to switch lanes and change his body into a muscle machine. We welcome Mr. Muscle Man, our Terminator, Ustering, <laughs> Chai, the prodigy Gamba. What now? That was me breaking the air. I can see that. Do you, do you, do you that did it the, well, you did it no, well. No, it's like, <laughs> yeah. and, they wait, and then the bodybuilders go, you gotta get down low though. Oh, oh yes, when you guys go. That's it. You gotta transition into the pose. 
transition into That's the it. pose Correct. and then Correct, then you hit a front double, that's it. You, you can see as a child, I used to watch a lot of it. Now here's the thing, how many white eggs have you had today? I'll be honest with you, um, and my coach will probably be not too happy to hear this right now, but I'm currently in my off season, and I'm supposed to be on a plan, but uh, she's a little bit lazy at the moment. So I've had three eggs today. White eggs? White and yellow. Why are you allowed yellow? Uh, I'm in the off season, so I'm allowed a bit of more fat. Now, I'm, since I'm in my off season, I'm trying to pick up a bit more weight. Uh -huh. um, obviously, while I'm dieting and prepping for shows, uh, the yellows are very limited. In fact, if not even any at all. Is it true you guys eat 12 times a day on, on season? It all depends on the athletes. Some athletes may have faster metabolisms than others. Uh -huh. They will require more food. Um, for myself, I mean, I get away with about six to seven meals a day when I'm, when I'm on prep. And th then it's like, you know, white eggs, tuna, broccoli, yeah, it's, steamed chicken, yeah, it's brown rigorous. rice, water. Thank God not for brown rice, white rice these days. Or you can go for white rice. Yeah, thank God. That's sacrilegious. That, those are carbs. What not is wrong at all. With you? Not at all. I also used to have the same mindset up until this year. So for the last seven years of my bodybuilding career, I thought brown rice was the way. Yeah. So I started with my new coach and said, no, 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 no. White rice is actually the way. And it worked. He was very, very right in his methods. I, at first, I didn't believe him. Yeah. And, um, and then he actually put me through my paces, and I said, okay, I'm going to go with this. Mm. Did my first show, and I was like, okay, damn, he knows his stuff. He's right. So white rice is actually the way. And three days before competition, yeah. do, you, do you dehydrate yourself so that your muscles can be, like, they can protrude? Yeah, so what it is is um, you actually... So if you're competing, say you're competing on the Saturday. Yeah. The Saturday before, meaning a week before, you actually look, start. Look, oh my word, look at you, you are a house. <laughs> I am going to call Pam Goldie so that we can come view you on a Sunday. <laughs> on the regular, right? <laughs> like, look at that. that. That's two bedroom, two baths, extra balcony. <laughs> you're killing me, man, you're killing okay, me. Okay, yes, and then three days before. Yeah, so basically, yeah, so a week before the show, you actually start something known as your, your water load. Um, some people like to do it with normal water, some distilled. Mm -hmm. um, for the first time this year, I did distilled. And you actually load about probably 30 to 40 liters. Well, I did about 30 to 40 liters. Mm. Um, by the Thursday, I start cutting my water. Okay. So I'll cut my water by about 12 o'clock, somewhere there, and I won't drink again up until I'm done with the show Saturday night. And are you taking those pills, the... Diuretics? Water retention. Water retention. Yeah, so, uh, you know, they, there's a big stigma around taking diuretics because it's actually not good for your kidneys. Okay. So, you know... For the first time, I actually decided, my coach decided, look, he's going to prep me in a way that um, you don't need to I'm not going to take these, these tablets okay. because he wants to have longevity in the sport with an athlete rather than trying to have a quick success but damaging your body. Mm. So um, I attend that to him in that he actually managed to actually get my body dry, not as dry as I would have liked, but mm. at least I maintained my health. Yeah. That was the important part. Yeah. So let's go back to when you still thought you were going to play for the Springboks. Oh, yeah, I don't want to play for them anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Especially kidding. Especially now. For life. Maybe, you, maybe they need you now. Maybe you're the guy, G. Maybe. I, uh, I, don't, I could try. I, I don't mean, know. can't run the 100 anymore, but I can try. <laughs> we need tries. That's, I'm glad <laughs> that, we can try. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> okay, so you said you wanted to play for the Springboks. What was your body like then and as a teenager and growing up? And what's the difference to it now? Now, so I think, you know, I started playing rugby actually only at the age of 14. Um, by the time I started, I was very skinny. I mean, I entered grade eight, I think I was 54 kilos. Um, by the time I got to grade nine, I saw my brother, you know, he was playing rugby already for a couple of years already, high school. And sometimes what he would do is he would buy something called creatine. Yes. Yeah, and I was like, I didn't know what it was. So like, I saw his methods, I'd watch him, he would mix it with grape juice. Every time he would leave to go to rugby, I'd be like, cool, I'll take my own little cup Mix my own creatine, uh. put some grape juice, mix it up, and drink it, and I'll do that three, four times a day. Did you not gain weight? You know what the funny thing was? I actually started to grow, and I was like, I actually don't understand this. So then I said to my mom, I said, look, I want to get into the gym. I want to start training. So my, my mom was like, that's fine. Tell, tell your dad. My dad got me a gym contract. Uh, my brother bought me my first type of protein, and luckily it was USN as well. Okay. So it was muscle, I think it was muscle fuel or something like that. And um, funnily enough, my body managed to grow very, very quickly. By the time I was in grade 11, I already had a frame on me. You know, by the time I was when in grade 11... When you say 11, frame, that's when you built like a door. Uh, better than a door. I would like to say a little bit more aesthetically uh, please, uh, pleasing <laughs> than a door, because the door's not really something nice to look at. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and, and I grew quite nicely, and um, I realised, I said, hey, you know, I've got a knack for this, so, you know... Do you not I mean? think that that was your natural build? Like, 
So what and did you it, just kind of aided it along. Correct. So what it basically was is my genetics responded very well to training ah, and to supplementation. Ah, so that's what it was. Okay. Is that the genetics within me that I also inherited from my parents or mm. you know grandparents or whatever were manifested quite well in me that when I did all of these things and brought the, the whole cog together, mm. it just managed to work the cog work faster. So my, my genetics were good and my body managed to grow through those genetics. So when, when people say, oh, she's got such a naturally good body, th that, that's not true. People, like you can have a naturally good you body, but yeah. you can match it with discipline and Correct. training. Correct. You know, I hate it when a lot of people come to me and be like, oh, yeah, but you just got genetics. No, genetics don't wake you up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go do cardio for an hour or to go do weight training without any food in your tummy. Uh -huh. So it takes a lot of hard work and dedication. And discipline. And discipline. What Definitely. can break your discipline? Like what... You know, be it like a girl or like a, like a certain party or a certain food. Absolutely. There's a lot that can break your discipline, especially when you're prepping for shows. For myself, what I try and do, I'm trying to eliminate myself from certain situations. So what I'll do when I start prepping, when I'm about 10 weeks out, yeah. I won't club, I won't drink. Um, I'll try and limit the number of friends that I see, even though it's, it's harsh, but luckily I've got good friends that understand my situation, even family. I don't see much family. I, I pretty much become a recluse, and that's what bodybuilding sometimes is about, is that sometimes it forces you into those sort of situations. But you also mm. need to learn to have a balance. A lot of people don't have balance when it comes to bodybuilding. Yeah. And then that becomes like it's, a, it's an obsession. They're the ones who scream at the competitions. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's them trying to just express themselves <laughs> to be like, pick me, pick me. No, it's I miss my friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so silly. Okay. So the day you start bodybuilding, are you not scared that you're gonna become like Tabby? No. So I think for me, what I've always said to myself and I maintain this is that the day I stop bodybuilding doesn't mean that's the day I'm gonna stop training. Uh, I will always train. It's it's in me, it's in my blood, it's what I enjoy to do, it's my escape from the world. Mm. And um, it's something that I always do. Obviously I'll definitely lose weight and also because sometimes it can be uncomfortable trying to roam around at 120 kilos, 125 kilos mm. all year. It's very uncomfortable. So, I mean, for me, I'll come down to a weight that I'm comfortable with yeah. and, and just keep that and, and, and just enjoy training and not have the pressure of bodybuilding and of competing. And what, when you've done bodybuilding and you know you've won the competitions that we've seen you there, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you can break. Uh, like, what have you won? Um, I won a couple of shows. I mean, I, I won my first show back in 2010. Yeah. Um, I won the Gauteng Provincials this year. Um, and then at Nationals, I placed fourth, which I really didn't think I should have placed fourth, but it's a subjective sport, <laughs> and, the ju and the judges choose how the judges choose. You didn't so scream loud argue. enough. I, I think so, yeah, I didn't scream loud enough. <laughs> That's it, I didn't scream loud enough. Yeah. That's it, yeah. Okay, so when you're done, let's say you're there, at, at, you know, you, you're winning the Gauteng, Nash, the Gauteng one, and then you're placing fourth at Nationals, right afterwards, what's the first thing you eat? Is it like a beer? Is it a pizza? It's a pizza. Pizza. It's a pizza. It's, it's norm, the norm is all of the pizza. Really? But for me, I'm very fine. Sometimes it would be a pizza or to be burgers or, you know, but I'd normally to be a pizza for me. That's my go to. Okay, so yeah. basically you're telling us we shouldn't be eating pizzas if we're not training. Well, it's all subjective, eh? <laughs> thank you very much, Shi. Uh, <laughs> I know who to call now when I need a bodyguard. <laughs> Lee Binks is up right, next. Her evolution from timid, skinny, and awkward wallflower is a far cry from what she looks like now. Uh, share with us on Twitter about your transformation stories. Please make sure to send the pictures as well. And welcome back to Real Talk today, looking at body art and modification. So we've talked tech twos, we've talked scarring and weightlifting so far. Now let's meet Lee Bings. Her body has earned her numerous awards. Most recently, she was crowned the overall winner of the International Federation of Bodybuilding and Fitness. That sounds important. Um, National Ladies Physique. Oh, is that the entire thing? So let's go get International Federation of Bodybuilding and Fitness National Ladies Physique. Girl, I, that's a mouthful. Yeah, just say IFBB for short. IFBB for short, it, yeah. that's the one. Okay, so when did you win this? <laughs> I, I, it was last year, actually. I didn't compete this year except for one show. Why so. didn't you compete this year? I did Arnold's at the beginning of this year, which was a huge show. Oh. Um, and then I decided to rather work on my weak spots and then come back next year. Okay, now that we're here, what are your weak spots? My glutes, my back, my shoulders. 
Do you get that in a scorecard after you compete where they're like, okay? No, you just kind of thumb suck. You, you know, you look at the picture, <laughs> you look at the winner, you're like, okay, I can work on that, you know? Yeah, so, I see what yeah. they want, I see what they want. Okay, so let's go back to this timid Lee who says she was a wallflower and was skinny. And obviously to put yourself in a place where you can build a machine like you are right now, it starts with your mind. Where was your mind when you decided to change? Um, I was, I was severely underweight. I was 37 kgs, recovering from cancer. And uh, my boyfriend at the time was like, you know, you've always wanted to do a pull-up. Let's see if you can do a pull-up. And my goal was like, okay, awesome, I'm gonna do one pull-up. And I did that pull-up. And then I started getting, you know, like the little baby abs. And I was like, you know, like, I got a little bit of muscle. Uh -huh. You know, maybe I should like, you know, cross another thing off my list and, you know, get in front of a crowd. And mm. I did my first show. No muscle. I just had these little ab things. No, I was like, you know, I was nothing. <laughs> you I, were like I, a toothpick with a little bit of definition. Yeah, that's, that, that was me, you know, like skinny abs, they call it. Um, but I came third and I was like, you know, maybe this is something I can do. And it was one of those kind of like snowball things. I've done like 25 shows. I've done Universe in Italy, came second, three national titles. So it's, it's something that I've grown to love. Uh, um, so going from 37 kilograms to what you are now, you, you kind of have to, besides training yourself there, you have to eat yourself there, right? Yeah, it's, okay. it's all about the eating. I, I eat like 5,000 calories a day at the moment. Obviously, I'm off season. Um, oh but my Lord, 5,000 calories. <gasps> yeah, I, I literally Fabulous. love eating. Yeah, but it's chicken and rice, you know, like there's nothing to be envious about. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. So you can't just take calories. You have to be specific of which calories you take. Yeah, so there are different approaches. Obviously, there's if it fits your macros, and some people do that. Like Chi does that a lot of the time, you yeah. know. When he's off season, he'll just eat, and it can be a pizza or whatever. I'm a lot more strict. So it's chicken and rice, oats and egg whites all day, every day. And when you're treating yourself, treat yourself, girl. Chocolate. Okay. Yeah. But it's dark chocolate. No. Also, you go normal like we do. Yeah, like top deck. Okay, come through, yeah. come through, come through. <laughs> so, uh, would you call yourself an extremist? <sighs> yes. I, I, I guess I'd have to. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm still very shy. I'm still very introverted. Um, and it's a, a big adjustment for me. For, you know, like, it's funny because I've become a lot more accepting of people as I've gotten bigger, because yeah. you get a lot of negative negativity, you know, like you get the, the people commenting, ew, gross, disgusting, you know, like, you know, you get onto Tinder and then the people, you know, like they swipe right yeah. and you're like, awesome, we got a match. And then they send you a message like, oh, you're a female or a guy. And you're kind of like, okay, so you, you kind of have to, you know, like reinvent yourself. Yeah. I used to walk looking down and I still do a lot of the time because I don't want to see the negative stares. Mm -hmm but I've had to kind of embrace myself and go like, this is me. Mm. Like, if you, if you don't like the way mm. I look, okay, cool. Mm. But what is normal? Can you answer what is normal? Give you, us this definition of normal that you, we must if, all if, adhere to. Exactly, if you walk through the shops, there is no two people who look the same. There yeah. is no, and then you've got magazines, newspapers, TV, all pushing this same narrative, this narrative of what a beauty, what mm. beauty is, you know, over photoshopped, skinny, you know, makeup to yeah, yeah. there and gone. And so everyone's kind of trying to fit into this realm of what beauty is and what they should look like. But they're not accepting themselves for who they are. And my number one rule is love you for you. Yeah. Love your imperfections because I've, I've come across too many women who are struggling, trying to get to this ideal perfect. Mm. They hate their stretch marks. Mm. They hate their nose. They hate this, they hate that. Okay, so change what you can, mm. but along the way, learn to love yourself because mm. otherwise you're screwed because you'll get to that perfect body that you've been working so damn hard for, you still hate yourself. Ah, oh, because you could change everything and if, you st if your mind is not in the place where you're loving yourself, then, then what was it worth? Exactly. But now do you, is this why bodybuilders date each other? What you're saying about Tinder and you know the stares that you get? Because I always find like even at the gym, like you know when I go once a year to you know get a smoothie. Um, Shame <laughs> on you. <laughs> I, I, get, uh, yeah. I find the couples like 
the body pill, the guys are dating the body pill girls because is it an, is like is there an understanding that's there? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a, an understanding. There's kind of like this mutual kind of like mm. I know what you're going through. Mm. You know, I'm gonna support you. I mean, comp prep is not the easiest thing. Um, you comp prep, that's competition. Prep. Yeah, co uh, prepping for a show. Yeah, I mean, you're you're restricting your calories. You're I mean, I trained for four hours a day leading up to show. Um, I got my body fat percentage to single digits. I was like eight, seven percent body fat. Wow. I could see every single striation on my body. I was lean, but a lot of people will go, that's a bit extreme. Yeah. You know, so if you're dating someone who's in the same field as you, you're mm. kind of like, yeah, you can get me. And, you know, much like the dating each other in the industry, do you find that you have to work in the industry? Because there aren't many jobs that are going to allow you to be at the gym for five hours a day. You know, I, I know plenty of bodybuilders who live, who work nine to fives, completely normal jobs. I, I mean, the, the physique champion male bodybuilder um, who won, I think, last year, he's won like three times. He's a realtor during the day. Okay. Yes, I'm a personal trainer. Yeah. Um, I tell people not to eat cookies all day. Put the cookie down. <laughs> put the cookie, you Put know, the cookie down you know, and so lift the leg. <laughs> exactly. You know, so that's what I do. But that's because I love it. Yeah. And I want to help other people get to stage. I want, you know, I specialize in, in training. Body transformation. Body transformations, especially females, because I understand female bodies. And that's what I do. But that's because I love it. Mm. And I wake up and, you know, I was a makeup artist for 10 years. Hated my job, hated it. And then I started doing personal training and I was like, you know, I can wake up. And so I you've can... always been in transformation? Yeah, I, I guess so, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm artsy, I can't, I can't <laughs> calculate absolutely anything. Yeah. You know, like give me a, a nine to five job where I have to type something and you I know, somebody cannot. said personal trainers can't count because every time you're like, Three more, three more, uh, no, three no, more. I, you no, know, I'm guilty. Guys, it was three more, no, no, three no, times no, ago. I, I'm guilty of that <laughs> so hard. Okay, come <laughs> you, now. Uh, you know, like if I'm trying to count and you're talking at the same time, one or the other. Uh, you're just I'm, like, I'm either counting or like I'm, I'm talking. No, you're like, girl, it was ten, ten times ago. No, though. but it's also, you know, like a lot of the time it's kind of like seeing what you're able to do and then mm. pushing you because if you're training on your own and somebody says gonna ten cheat. reps, you're going to do those ten reps. Yeah. If you could do five more, would you? No. Yeah. So that's where I come in and I'm like, I can see you do, you can do more. Mm. Then, then we do more. So if I say, let's do 10 reps, but you've got 10 more in you, I'm going to push you to do those next 10. And that's how you got the body, because yeah. you can go the 10 more. Yeah. Listen, Lee, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> uh, good luck in your personal training uh, career and in your bodybuilding career. Thank you very much. Bring home those prizes. <laughs> and there you have it. To modify your body is an age-old trend that people have always done for different reasons and not just for rebellion, okay? Thank you to all my guests for joining us and sharing their colorful stories, their design art, and their knowledge. Until next time, be tolerant of each other. Cheers.